Welcome to the Christian Men at Work podcast, where I interview men from all walks of life with varying job titles who have one thing in common. They are all choosing daily to live out their Christian faith through their work, and because of that, they are leading, prospering, glorifying God, and experiencing joy and purpose in their work, and you can too. Men at Work, welcome to episode 41. Today I'm going to be speaking with Mark Driscoll, who is a Jesus-following, mission-leading, church-serving, people-loving, Bible-preaching pastor and the author of many books, including Real Marriage and Who Do You Think You Are? He has been grilled by Whoopi Wool Goldberg and Barbara Walters on The View, gone head-to-head with Piers Morgan on CNN, debated the existence of evil with Deepak Chopra on ABC's Nightline, bannered with the gang on Fox and Friends, and explained biblical sexuality on Loveline with Dr. Drew. And now he can add to that list uh, that he spoke with men at work on this podcast. Uh, Today we're going to be talking about his new book, Spirit-Filled Jesus, Live by His Power. And it is a very, um, very powerful interview. I say that, I use that word a lot of times with these interviews, but it really is the perfect description of this uh, interview. Um, We talk about really a whole new way of looking, at least for many of us, including myself, a whole new way of looking at our relationship with Jesus and and how we walk that out every day. So um, I think you're really going to enjoy this. So let's get right to our interview. Mark, thanks a lot for joining the conversation today. And I'm going to start out with the same question I ask everybody, which is tell us about your life prior to becoming a Christian as well as uh, why and how you became a Christian. And if you would do me the favor of including in that description, tell a little bit about the story I read in your book where God told you to do four things with your life. Yeah, no, well, thanks for having me on. Um, So I was born in 1970, Grand Forks, North Dakota. As soon as my folks could afford a full tank of gas, we left Grand Forks, North Dakota. Ended up uh, growing up in the People's Republic of Seattle, um, was a poor working class kid. My dad was a union drywaller. My mom was a born again Catholic. She got saved kind of in the charismatic Catholic renewal. So she loved Jesus. I for sure didn't. And then, um, in high school was kind of a moral God conscious, maybe a, you know, God fear to use sort of Bible language, but didn't, didn't know Jesus, didn't love Jesus. And was in high school and met a uh, pastor's daughter who I just, my heart, just went immediately in her direction. She was gravity for me. And uh, she bought me a Bible. We uh, started seeing one another. And then I went off to State University and started reading that Bible that she gave me and um, got saved as a kind of Jack Catholic kid sitting in my dorm, actually reading Romans. I didn't know about Martin Luther at the time, but I guess my path was a little bit similar in that regard. And um, God gave me an immediate love for the Bible, and then I had to find a good church, and God was very gracious, found a really, really good, healthy, loving, uh, Bible-based church with wonderful people, and um, started attending there. Uh, The gal who bought me the Bible moved out and attended school uh, where I attended, and we were married there uh, between our junior and senior year, and it was in my freshman year. I was at a men's retreat uh, with the church, and uh, they said to go get some time, you know, with the Lord. And to be honest with you, I'm a brand new Christian. I don't know exactly what that means, but I'm just going for a walk along a river and just kind of talking out loud to God conversationally. And he spoke to me and said to Mary Grace, preach the Bible, train men, and plant churches. Told me four things to do audibly. Um, I came back, told my pastor, man, I think God talked to me. Does he still do that? I didn't know. And uh, he said, yeah, that was the will of the Lord for you. So I uh, really committed myself to that. That's what I've been doing uh, ever since. And so uh, as of today, I've been with that sweet girl over 30 years. We've been married, uh, faithfully married 26 plus years. We've got five kids. Uh, we've got three boys, two girls. And, um, yeah, I've been teaching books of the Bible ever since. Preached through a couple of dozen books of the Bible, verse by verse. I'm kind of an old school throwback hour, a point sermon preacher guy. I went on and got a master's degree in uh, 
basically in Bible. And uh, we planted a church as a family in Scottsdale, Arizona, a few years ago, the Trinity Church. Uh, really, really good. Great, dear, lovely, wonderful people, and things are going really good. So, yeah, I mean, my whole life pivoted when a really sweet gal bought me a nice Bible. And since then, everything's just been completely transitioned. And uh, and she's the best gift God's ever given me after salvation. And the Bible that she gave me was life-changing. So that's kind of that's kind of my story. Well, it's a great story, and I do want to pause just a second on the you hearing from God audibly because I don't know how many times someone has told me that, but I have to admit that the first couple times I heard that, I had my doubts that it was true. <laughs> yeah. I no longer have I no longer have the doubts just because of the people that have told me that, and I always uh, I have to admit uh, some envy of that. Um, but uh, I just I just wanted to throw that out there and just say that that I don't know how many people may maybe ask you about that when you give your testimony about how amazing that would be. Uh, is there anything you want to just add to that? <laughs> because I don't know what percentage of Christians uh, experience that, but I'm imagining it's low. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I believe God's always talking to us through his word, through circumstances, through conscience. Um, you know, through leadings of the Holy Spirit, through wise counsel of others. Um, and God's spoken to me at strategic times through prophetic dreams or words. Um, you know, I haven't, I've heard from him audibly a few times in my life. Um, those were the significant pivot points in my life. And at the time, I didn't even really have a theology of it. Like, I, I didn't know that God did that. I, I didn't go to a church that talked about that. And so for me, it was like, what the heck is going on? So, uh, some people grow up in traditions where it's, you know, more commonly taught and practiced. And for me, it was like, I, I don't know what's going on. So, um, but for me, you know, God just came off as, you know, being an authority for sure. But also um, just very loving. It was more like the voice of a father speaking to a kid, telling him, son, here's, you know, here's the next season and I need you to be ready for it. And so, you know, I, I praise God for his kindness to me in that. Um, but I would say Jesus says, you know, a, dull, a wicked and adulterous generation seeks for a sign. And so I would just tell people, you know, don't don't chase signs and wonders, chase Jesus. And, and signs and wonders might follow you, uh, but we're never to follow them. Right. Well, and I, I thought it was worth noting, personally, you know, just listening that, um, you know, you, for what it's worth, you weren't using a lot of these and nows at the time you were just talking to God like you'd talk to anybody else so uh that that was worth noting for me <laughs> uh well i i want to spend the majority of our time talking about your book that uh called spirit filled jesus I w my first question about the, from the book was a comment you made early in the book which just jumped out at me which said and i'm going to quote it i view my bible the same way a person on a capsized ship adrift in the ocean swimming for his life views a life preserver. Without my Bible, I'd be drowned, done, and doomed. So my question around that is, how common do you believe that kind of attitude is among Christians? Not necessarily to be condemning, but just to be real uh, about it. And, and how would the church and the world be different if that attitude really was common among the church? Yeah, I think the Bible is the most widely translated, most widely published, um, but least read book there is, you know, and so um, it seems like God's word for many, sadly, is sort of, you know, the last resort rather than the first response. And so, you know, for me, I, I am not a legalist. I'm about relationship, not rules. I, I am I am not a person that has I don't even have honestly a daily focus at quiet time. I'm not that guy. But I am in the Bible at some point every day because I like it. I enjoy it. I um, I find life in it. I'm intrigued by it. I'm changed by it. I find that God meets me in the scriptures every single time in an extraordinary way. And so, you know, for me, I think if we can get people to understand that, you know, learning God's word and studying God's word and memorizing God's word is not something that you have to do, but it's something you get to do. It's not part of just your religious devotion. It's part of the joy of the relationship with the Lord. I mean, I've, you know, my wife, Grace, um, you know, we've been together 26 years. And uh, every time I 
get to sit down and, and sort of be with her and converse with her. I, I just feel richly blessed. I feel that way when I open the Bible. I feel like that's amazing that God would supernaturally, through the Holy Spirit, meet with me here, that he would listen to me, that he would talk with me, and that I could have a meeting with God, a sacred meeting with God, and I can hear from God through his word any time that I want. It seems like that should be, you know, at the top of the priority list and the first thing that, you know, I go to. And I think for many, many people, it's not that they don't want to, it's just that they get distracted, they get diverted, um, or they maybe lack the courage. They say, you know, I don't, I don't know how to do that. But like anything, you know, it's just making mistakes until you make some progress. And so, you know, for anybody who's listening, I just would say, and, you know, you cannot, you cannot consider one minute in God's word as a wasted minute. And God, God oftentimes is teaching us things today for things that will endure tomorrow. And so, you know, oftentimes we think, well, you know, I don't need that today. It's like, no, 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 what you're doing is you're preparing yourself for tomorrow. And God knows what tomorrow holds. And if we don't get that time to hear from him today, we're going to be in trouble tomorrow. All right. Well said. In the book, you invite the reader to not only have a relationship with Jesus, which I think is the language that most of us Christians use, but to actually do what Jesus did and have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. And that I saw that as kind of a, a key statement for the whole book. Why do you think it's important to have a relationship with the Holy Spirit specifically? Yeah, well, that's that's kind of thank you for pulling it out. Thank you for reading the book. Sometimes people don't, but um, yeah. The, so the whole concept behind the Spirit Filled Jesus book and project is Jesus' life is admired by Christians and non Christians. The question is, can his life be experienced by God's people? And when we think of Jesus, I think uh, we know he is. You know, for those of us who are Christians, he's fully God and fully man, one person, two natures. Um, and when he does things like overcome temptation or suffer or learn, um, we tend to think that he does so out of his divinity. And I'm making the case in the book that he lived much, if not most, of his earthly life out of his humanity. Um, He didn't avail himself to his divine attributes, and instead he humbly chose to live by the person, the presence, the power of the Holy Spirit. And so if you look at Jesus' life, uh, the question is, how did he do it? How did he live the most impactful, significant, transforming life in the history of the planet. He had no wealth. He had no spouse. He had no office. He had no assistant. He had no army. He never traveled more than a few miles from home. He never penned a book. I mean, how did he do it? Well, he lived, the Bible is very clear, I believe, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so uh, as we understand that what it means to be spirit-filled is to be like Jesus, what it means to be spirit-led is to be like Jesus, I think it takes a lot of the weirdness off of the conversation of the Holy Spirit. And sometimes the Trinity is, you know, portrayed as the Father is the mean one and Jesus is the nice one and the Holy Spirit is the weird one. And I'm trying to sort of, you know, recast all of that, that actually they live together in relationship and uh, and it's the Holy Spirit who empowers the life of Jesus. So Jesus is never alone. He's always living with the person, presence, power, the Holy Spirit. And when he faces temptation, trouble, trial, he endures and overcomes those things by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then he tells us that he's going to send us the Holy Spirit as our helper. And then the Holy Spirit helps us as the Holy Spirit helped Jesus so that we can manifest the character of Christ and the circumstances that Christ faced. So I think there's a lot written on Jesus. There's quite a bit written on the Holy Spirit. And honestly, I've seen very little written on uh, the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the life of Jesus, putting those two together. And I think once a believer sort of understands that, then uh, then having the power of Christ in you, the Holy Spirit, it gives you a lot of hope for changing your future and to follow it in the footsteps of Christ. And so the big idea is God doesn't want us just to, you know, uh, appreciate the life of Jesus. He also wants us to experience it. Well, well and what kept coming up to me as I was reading the book was, you know, I've heard before that, you know, that Christ came uh, to sacrifice you know, to overcome sin, but he also came to provide a model for us, although the second point seems to be de-emphasized, and the the first point is, is has always been emphasized, at least for me, and maybe it's because we don't quite know what to do with that second part, like, what, you know, he's he's perfect, right? How do we model ourselves after him when he's perfect and and we're not? And I thought that 
your section in your book where you talk about five false concepts of Christ was really helpful in kind of getting over that hurdle of how do we model ourselves after him. Can you talk, kind of walk us through some of these false concepts of, of Christ, maybe how they're manifested so we can relate to some of them and recognize them? Yeah, let's see if I can pull them up off the top of my head. I mean, one of them is that he was just fully, solely God, but not man. And so, uh, you know, we see him as God, and we're not God, so we can't live like he lived. A lot of the first movies about Jesus sort of portrayed him with an angelic glow and a halo, and he wasn't fully human. The other is that Jesus is, you know, fully, totally, consistently human. He's just a really great man, but it overlooks him as God. Some of the cults will say that he is like basically um, an angelic being. That would be Jehovah's Witnesses, that he lives by a supernatural divine power, but he's a created being. He's not the creator. Um, In addition, um, more popular more recently on uh, the History Channel and stuff is that Jesus was an alien, that uh, he, he, he did do supernatural things and he lived an extraordinary life, but he really was a visitor from another planet. And, um, and, and, and as weird as that might sound, I mean, you know, in the world of superheroes, I guess Jesus then becomes kind of like Superman, you know, um, or the view is that he set aside the continual use of his divine attributes and he lived out of his humanity most of the time. And he lived by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's the argument that I'm making. And um, and I think, you know, for most people, they they see Jesus as perfect, but they don't know how he overcame temptation. You know, how did he do it? The uh, Bible says that he was tempted in every way as we are yet without sin. So, um, you know, he faced the things that we faced. He, you know, fought the obstacles that we fought, and he overcame the things that come against us. And so, you know, to me, I, I think we many Christians are far more familiar with the divinity of Jesus as God than the full humanity of Jesus. We tend not to think, you know, he got tired, he got sick, he had to learn things, you know, not to be blasphemous, but at some point he had to use the restroom. You know, we don't, we don't think in those earthy terms, but that's what full humanity means. That's, that's what a human life is. Well, and, and I, I pulled up the book, too, just to double-check, because I realize there's a lot of details, even if you've written a book. But you, you pretty much hit them <laughs> as far as those false concepts. But um, I wanted to expand on one of them, which was the idea of the alien, because you make the point that it's, it's kind of interesting how he, he, there's, there's a unique way in which he is not Superman, which I thought was interesting. And is, you want, can you expand on that a little bit? <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, you know, some years ago there was a, a famous teacher, C.S. Lewis, and he said, Jesus is Lord, liar, or lunatic. And since that time, most people have said, well, those are your options. It's like, well, there is a new one, Alien. Um, you know, a lot of Alien films, a lot of video games, uh, like I said, a lot of things on the History Channel. And, you know, what I appreciate actually about the perspective is they say Jesus actually existed in history. He actually walked the planet, and he did extraordinary and supernatural things. It's like, well, okay, I agree with all of that. But when you ask why, they wouldn't say that he's God came down from heaven, but that he's a different being came down from a different planet or dimension. And so that makes him, you know, part of the created order and not fully God. Uh, but there is an increasing percentage, I would say, even of younger people who tend to think in those terms. And... um and so for us as Christians, it's like, okay, well, if they have a, if people have a misperception of the Lord Jesus, how do we, you know, help them have a correct perception? But honestly, in the past, you know, Jesus was just a moral and good man. He, he didn't have supernatural powers. He didn't do miracles and extraordinary things. That was more the prevailing uh, ideology and opposition to Christ, at least acknowledging that he lived and he did things that were extraordinary. At least it's a point of beginning and agreement. And uh, I guess... If I were not a Christian, you know, I might think that Jesus came down from another planet. And as a Christian, I know now that he came down from heaven. Well, that's a that's a much bigger and different deal. But I think they're they're at least going in a direction that's a little more helpful for coming to full understanding of who Christ is. Well, and it, I like how you said that, um, you know, Clark Kent pretended to be like the rest of us when, in fact, he was not. But yeah. that's not that's not the case with Jesus. He truly was like us in 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 his humanity, and I think that's the key thing that that uh, is just uh, I think lost on on most Christians. Yeah, yeah. I use the example of of 
Clark Kent. I mean, if you look at him externally, he looks like a, you know, a humble news reporter in his 30s, you know. But ultimately, he, he really underneath, you know, he's got the red S on his chest and he's Superman. And so when it looks like he's hungry or tired, you know, or struggling physically, it's all just fakery. Well, with Jesus, it wasn't that way. He he grew in wisdom, stature, and favor with men and God. But he really was tempted. He really did get hungry. He really did get tired. He really did suffer. And so the Bible says, you know, that he's a high priest that had to be made like us in every way. And so that is, in fact, true. And so I think when you understand that Jesus relates to you, uh, it becomes a lot easier for you to relate to Jesus. Um, if you understand that he's been through what you're going through, then you're more likely to go to him in your time of need. And so, you know, that's really my hope and prayer for the Spiritual Jesus book and project is just helping people to get a, a clear picture of Jesus a clear understanding of Jesus, and then inviting the Holy Spirit practically in the mundane details of daily life to help them to become increasingly more like Jesus. But, you know, you can tell people become like Jesus, but unless they've got an accurate picture of who Jesus is, they don't even know what that means. And so, so you've got to start there with a picture of Jesus before you can show them what it looks like to look like Jesus. Well, another another um, comment you made I thought was interesting, it was that Jesus one of the ways he matured, because the Bible talks about how he, he matured, was through trial and error. And that, again, that just kind of hits us like, okay, he's perfect. He, he, he couldn't have made mistakes. So I guess that that's maybe a key the, theological thing we need to grapple with, which is being being sinless while also making mistakes. Is that is that right? Well, it's, yeah, it's trial and error. I mean, the way that we learn how to do things is by trying it. I mean, so, you know, all the, most of the creeds go from he was born of the Virgin Mary, you know, crucified, suffered and died under Pontius Pilate. What they miss is his entire life, you know. Now, uh, Luke tells us in Luke, I think it's chapter 2, verse 40 and chapter 2, verse 52, that, that Jesus grew in wisdom, stature and favor with men and God, that he grew. And so, you know, again, uh, God doesn't learn anything. He knows everything, but Jesus had to learn. God doesn't grow, but Jesus grew because Jesus set aside the continual use of his divine attributes and he chose to live as we live. It's almost, I use the analogy when I preached it here at the Trinity church, like um, we were watching one of those, you know, family television shows where it's a competition and a guy gets on and he's going to shoot a bow and arrow and he's going to shoot I don't know, something off of somebody's head and he has sight, but he, he allows himself to be blindfolded. He has that, attribute of sight but he chooses not to use it and so there are many times when jesus is on the earth it's like that he has the attribute he knows everything he doesn't need to learn anything but he chooses not to use that he humbles himself to learn as we learn and so you know my big idea is as jesus was three and 13 and 23 he was perfect and perfectly mature for each season of life you know, but when Jesus was four years of age, if uh, Mary was teaching him how to ride a bike, you know, did he jump on it and go to the BMX track and do a bunch of backflips day one, or did he have to wobble and figure it out? You know, when he was learning how to write out the Hebrew alphabet, you know, did he just sit down with perfect, you know, motor skills, nail it, or did he have to learn? And, you know, to me, Luke 2 seems to indicate he, he had to learn stuff. Well, th that means there's a difference between normal trial and error, maturing and learning through doing, and absolute sinless moral perfection. And so, you know, I've got five kids. I love them with all my heart and three boys, two girls. And when they're little, they're just things that they're learning. They're, you know, they're carrying their, you know, their fishies in their hand, you know, their fishy crackers, and they trip over their own feet and spill their fishy crackers. I, I don't think that's a sin. I think that's part of their humanity, and it's learning how to walk and carry fishy crackers. And so, you know, sometimes legalistic parenting and relationships, they will take moral perfection and then just turn that over into total perfection, you know? If you get up one day and you forget to make your bed, you know, I mean, is that a sin? I don't know. You know, I mean, you learn by doing stuff, and, and it's not – there's a difference between a, a sin and trial and error in, in my experience. And, and as a parent, I, I used to say that to the kids all the time. There's a, there's a difference between committing a sin and trial and error. There just is, you know. So I don't discipline my kids when they're growing up for trial and error. I just deal with them for sin. 
Well, when we talk about applying how Jesus lived his life to our lives, I mean, you can you can talk about a lot of different ways to apply that, but you, you put a, a real emphasis on our relationships in your book, and specifically you describe 12 relationship lanes, all of which that Jesus had, and all of which I think we all have, and um, I thought that was really interesting how you did that because it, it allowed me to kind of place myself in in each of those and think about how Jesus actually dealt at some level with the things that I deal with. Can you kind of walk us through just a few of those lanes and how maybe some examples of how how Jesus actually uh, experienced those different lanes? Yeah, and I, so I you know drove to work today in my Jeep here in Scottsdale, Arizona, sun's out, it's nice, I got the top off and I'm driving in the Jeep, um, and every one of us driving here, we've got our lane, and, uh, you know, I had somebody this morning that decided that my lane should be their lane, it just about hit me, so I, you know, as a ministry to them, I hit the horn, you know, as a way of serving them with Christ's love, so um, the point was like, hey, this is my lane, it's not your lane, you got to stay in your lane. I see the relationships in our life kind of similarly, and there are people that you know, travel more closely with us. There are people that are more distant from us. So for Jesus, you know, he's got enemies who really hate him. Try to keep those in the faraway lane. Uh, he's got uh, former friends that he grew up with. There's distant relatives. There's former workmates or classmates. There's closer relatives. There are your closest family and friends. There's, you know, if you're married, your spouse, your kids, there's your relationship with the Lord that each of these lanes, different people get different proximity to us, access with us, you know, resources from us. And the, the hard part in life is trying to figure out who goes in what lane. Because some people, you know, they want to be your very best friend. And you're like, I, I didn't pick you or, or you're an enemy. I don't want to do life with you. You're not safe. You're dangerous. I can't have you close. You need to be far. And you start to think of all the relationships that Jesus had. I mean, he's got people he grew up with in Nazareth and he's got his disciples in there, he's got the inner circle of three, Peter, James, and John, crowds of upwards of 120 or somewhere in his leadership orbit. There are occasions where 5,000 men plus women and children, so that could be 20 or 30,000 people come out to hear him preach. People are following him from town to town. They all want a counseling meeting. They want a healing. They want a free meal. They want him to cast their demon out. Everybody's got questions. I mean, and just to think, you know, Jesus doesn't have an office. He, he doesn't have an assistant. It's not like he can set up a counseling session and say, hey, get on my books. And so, you know, how does Jesus maintain his first priority? And that's relationship with God the Father and spend time, you know, being filled and empowered and unburdened by God the Holy Spirit. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot of what we think of the ministry of the Holy Spirit is in the miraculous, and he does do the miraculous, but he also does the mundane. He helps us figure out how to navigate relationships. He helps us figure out how to deal with wise, foolish, and evil people. He helps us to figure out how to give our best time and energy to our first priority relationships. And so a lot of the book, uh, the Spirit-Filled Jesus book, is just super practical. It's about relationships. It's about suffering. It's about emotional health. Really, really practical stuff taken from uh, the life of Jesus. And Jesus obviously is incredibly relational, um, but he has even healthy relationships with unhealthy people, you know, and how do you do that? I mean, that's one of the toughest things in life is how to be emotionally healthy, have healthy relationships and have safe boundaries, even with unhealthy people. Well, speaking of dealing with people, you, you spent a, a pretty good section just talking about the issue of forgiveness. And I, I understand why that's because that's very important. Um, and you give seven reasons why we should forgive. Can you walk us through some of those reasons? Yeah. So, I mean, forgiveness is the essence of the Christian faith. I mean, some of our creeds say, you know, I believe in the forgiveness of sins. I mean, it's kind of Christianity 101, but forgiveness glorifies God. Our God is a God who forgives. And when we forgive, we're reflecting something of the character of God. Uh, forgiveness also, it is a witness to others. Non-Christians are watching, and they want to see if we really do practice forgiveness. Um, it's also a blessing to you. It helps you to unburden, to get out of the cycle of bitterness and torment and, you know, just emotional, you know, brokenness and, and to start to heal up and move forward, um, you know, with the life that God has and God intends for you. Uh, one of the most powerful, in my opinion, is 
Uh, forgiveness defeats the demonic. Satan and demons are never forgiven of anything. They never forgive anyone for anything. Hell is the place where there is no forgiveness. And so if you decide because you've been wounded, hurt, abused, traumatized, taken advantage of, all of which could be 100% actual and factual, and we want to grieve that and be sympathetic toward it, but, you know, in that moment, you know, uh, if you don't uh, forgive, you, you know, what you're doing is you're really pulling hell up into your life. And so, you know, James, Jesus, the half-brother says it, I think in James 3, there's certain quote-unquote wisdom that's unforgiving that is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. And so when you're standing on the earth and you're hurt, you're offended, something traumatic or tragic has happened, you have two options. I'm going to pull hell up into my life. And if you don't forgive, that's what you're doing. You're pulling the demonic up into your life. Or you can reach up and say, I'm going to pull heaven down into my life. And heaven is the place of forgiveness. Everybody in heaven is forgiven. The God of the Bible gives and does forgiveness. And so, you know, when we're on the earth, it's like, okay, I'm going to pull heaven down or I'm going to pull hell up. You know, what am I going to do? And people that choose bitterness, unforgiveness, vengeance, wrath, they're literally pulling the demonic up into their life. And it, it just wreaks havoc in hell because Satan doesn't want to just ruin your enemy. He wants to ruin you too. And unforgiveness is it's a foothold. I say that, you know, I travel some for work and, you know, get on an airplane and it's a vehicle by which I go from one place to another. It transports me. Well, I believe for the demonic, unforgiveness is a carrier. It's a mode of transportation. It's a way that the enemy gets to journey into our life and go into our future with us. And so, you know, when we choose to forgive from the heart, like the Lord Jesus said, I think we cancel demonic torment, attack, and, and harm in our own life. And, I mean, I'm a pastor. I love people. I've been a senior pastor for 20-some years. It's a great honor. But I have never seen anyone who didn't forgive that it actually benefited and blessed them and the people who did life with them. Every person who chooses not to forgive is choosing to self-harm, and then that harm infects and affects others. Uh, well said. And um, not, that, not that anything needed to be added to everything you just said, but I, I'm always struck by the, the verse that says that if I don't forgive, I won't be forgiven. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I call those the Scooby-Doo verses. You read those and you're like, I'm not sure what that means, but I'm, that's scary. You know, yeah, uh, exactly. Like Jesus says, if you don't forgive others, your father in heaven won't forgive you. You're like, I don't even want to figure out what that means. That's scary. Right. <laughs> exactly. All right. Well, I want to shift gears for the rest of our conversation and tap into your your thoughts about the topic of faith and works. And that's, you know, one of the areas of focus for for this podcast. And and uh, my first question around that is, what is the greatest misunderstanding that men have about their their work in in your in your opinion um well for men i think um there's a performance mentality it's the first thing that comes to mind many guys they have a performance you know mentality in relationship to god the god's almost like a boss he gives them a job description and then they get a performance review and contingent upon their performance is his affection and approval and so then you're working for the father's approval, not from it. You're working for the relationship, not from the relationship. First thing that comes to mind is, you know, uh, one of the most significant moments in the history of the world was when Jesus was baptized. And there the father speaks from heaven and says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. And you think about it, you think, man, in our world, you think that would come after the resurrection. You know, that Jesus would get his performance review. He'd get his report card after all of his work was done, because on the cross he said, it is finished. So that meant his work was done. No, the Father tells him that he is pleased with him before, insofar as we can tell, before he preached a sermon, before he performed a miracle, before he healed a person, before he raised a dead person, before he healed the sick. I mean, before Jesus did anything, the Father said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. And so our relationship with God starts with his approval, starts with his blessing, starts with his uh, satisfaction in us, and then we work from that, not for that. And that makes all the difference in the world. I've got, you know, I've got five kids. If I looked at my kids and said, if you will produce, if you will perform, you know, if you will execute, um, then when all is said and done, I, I will strongly consider loving you and being your father. That would absolutely create a performance-based relationship, a works-based relationship. 
And if I just looked at him and said, I love you, I'm devoted to you, I'm committed to you, whether you succeed or fail, my affection for you is unchanged, it frees them up then to go live their life and to do the things that God has made for them to do, knowing that the relationship is secure and the relationship is not contingent on their performance. And so, you know, for many, many, many people, I think they would say that they're saved by grace, but I think they really believe that their relationship with God is kept because of their works. Yeah, I agree. It's it's a big issue, and it's one it's one of those things you can hear again and again, but it's it's hard to let that go. And so, um, I I think that was uh, that was well well said. And I guess it, related to that question is kind of like okay, that there there's our our attitude about performance uh, in our relationship with God uh, relating to work. But I guess a, another question I commonly ask is. What does it look like to live out your faith at work? In other words, for a Christian man, because our listeners are primarily men, that's the name of the show, for those Christian men who sincerely want to go beyond just going to church on Sunday and actually living out their faith in their life, uh, specifically at their job, because they spend so much of their time at their job, what are some ways that they can do that? Well, I mean, firstly, you know, work is worship. And so, um, you know, the question is, you know, for me, when did Jesus start his ministry? I think he's doing ministry for the years where he is. I mean, Jesus spent the first 30 years of his life, you know, swinging a hammer with his dad. And then he spent the last three years, the last 10 percent of his life preaching, teaching, casting out demons and dealing the miraculous. And the question is, well, but was one of those sacred and the other secular? It's like, no, no, no. They were both sacred because he was doing uh, the will of God. So as long as you're doing the will of God, it's ministry, it's worship, it's unto the Lord, it's sacred. And I, and I think that is one of the great gifts of the Protestant Reformation is to sort of break that sacred and secular divide and say, doing your job well is an act of worship and doing your job well is part of your ministry. I mean, I appreciate a doctor who knows what he's doing. I appreciate a mechanic that actually fixes the car on the first shot, you know. I appreciate the accountant who actually gets the numbers right, you know. And so part of it is just doing a good job and uh, and doing it well under the Lord. That is ministry. And some people say, well, how do I turn this into evangelistic opportunity or all of that? I think if we are faithful with the work that we do, that God sovereignly and supernaturally provides opportunities. And so, you know, like uh, Daniel is a marketplace man. Um, Joseph is a marketplace man. Nehemiah is a marketplace man. These are men who they have, quote unquote, secular jobs. They're working in government. They're working in building projects. They're raising funds. They're dealing with city planners and officials and attorneys and contracts. And they're in a professional vocational capacity. But these are some of the most significant leaders in the history of the world and some of the most significant uh, ministry leaders, even though they're not preachers, they're not pastors, they're not prophets, they're not apostles, they're not doing that kind of work. They're, you know, Nehemiah is building a city. Uh, Daniel is helping uh, establish, you know, healthy governance. Uh, Joseph is overseeing food distribution from a governmental agency. I mean, so you start to look at that, and and, uh, and the Bible gives us repeated examples of people who they just did their job well, and they were relational people, and then God supernaturally and sovereignly opened opportunities for them to share their faith. And so, you know, for example, I just think of Joseph, um, you know, the, the ruling pharaoh uh, says, you know, where can we find a man like this in whom the Spirit of God dwells? So in that, um, you know, he sees that, um, the Pharaoh sees that, uh, that God, the Holy Spirit, dwells in Joseph. Well, Joseph wasn't wearing a t-shirt that said, you know, hey, ask me if you want to know about the Holy Spirit. He was just living his life openly and publicly, doing an exceedingly good job in manifesting character, and that opened opportunities for others to trust him. Because sometimes, you know, the people are they're looking for our character before they want to hear our testimony, you know, and they want to see if we act with integrity over the course of time in our financial de- dealings and our relational dealings and our familial dealings. And if we do, 
you know, then it earns us the credibility to share the why because they agree with the, the who they see insofar as character goes. So I just encourage the guys, you know, that what you are doing, if it's the Lord's will, it's it's worship, it's witness, it's ministry, and don't worry so much about pivoting it into some significant overt ministry. Be faithful and wait for God to sovereignly and supernaturally open the opportunities for conversations and relationships to emerge that from which pivot the conversation toward Jesus, forgiveness of sin, and salvation, which is the ultimate. Mark, uh, what's your favorite scripture or life verse? Yeah, I don't know if I have one. I always get accepted. My wife always says my favorite book of the Bible is whatever one I'm teaching from at that time. Uh, but the one I come back to a lot is 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him, him who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's one of my favorites for sure. Do you have any final thoughts that you want to share before we finish up? Um, no, but if your ministry is to men, I just think um, I think them seeing God as a relational father who uh, loves them the way they love their children is crucial and key. I think one of the most significant things that happens in a man's life is God gives him children. And through his love, his affection, his enjoyment of his children, he starts to get a glimpse into the father heart of God. And uh, you just start to think as a man, well, if God's heart for me is like my heart toward this child, that opens up a whole new revelation and understanding for relationship for most men. So, you know, for those who have the privilege of being a, a dad or a grandpa, God loves you like that. And it doesn't matter how old you are, you're still you're still his kid and he's still the dad. Well, I really enjoyed our, our talk today, and I yeah, really enjoyed your you. book. How, if you, our man. listeners wanted, wanted to reach out to you or you know, get a hold of your book or contact you in any way, how would they go about doing that? Yeah, thanks for asking. Thanks for having me on. Uh, the book Spirit Filled Jesus is on sale everywhere, Walmart, Sam's Club, Barnes & Noble, Amazon, all the usuals. And then uh, for Bible teaching, you can go to markdriscoll.org. There's the website or the app. I think there's 300 sermons, books of the Bible. There's theological articles. You can sign up for free daily devotions. I'll send them to your inbox. Just a small mountain of Bible teaching. And uh, yeah, if I could help you learn God's word, that would be a huge blessing. So thanks in advance. Excellent. Well, thank you and have a great day. Thanks, buddy. Okay. Bye-bye. All right. Bye. Minute work. I hope you've enjoyed this interview as much as I have. We just heard about Mark Driscoll's journey being spirit-led and living out his Christian faith through his work. Each of our journeys are unique, but hopefully you've heard something in this episode to inspire you and give direction for your own personal daily work life. You can find links and other information from this show at DaveHilgendorf.com. Until next time, have a great day and God bless.